So hello, so I've got about 15 minutes now to try and get you guys excited about data. Well, I remember first coming across these ridiculously clever people who had scary job titles like a data scientist or a data engineer, and they were using these ridiculously clever tools and technologies that I didn't really understand, like artificial intelligence and machine learning. I remember getting really excited, thinking what the potential was for these clever people and these clever technologies to combine to make our world a much better place. So I felt quite underwhelmed, really, when I discovered that in the main, they're used to make slightly like, comfortable lives slightly more comfortable. So, you know, we can now use, um, save 10 pounds every time we want to uh, book a hotel room online. Or we can save 10 minutes every time we want to decide what film we want to watch next. But wouldn't it be cool if these ridiculously clever people and these clever technologies were combining to save 10 people from sleeping rough in our cities tonight? And that's a real outcome, a real outcome of the data for good revolution. And this revolution is a place that's a kind of intersection between charities and public bodies and all their domain knowledge and their data. And they're combining that with these clever people and these clever technologies to really drive insights and efficiencies and innovations in charities across the world. And the really cool thing is that this data for good revolution is being driven organically from the bottom up by all kinds of different people with all sorts of different skills. And most of them are using their time voluntarily because they've got a passion about solving problems in the social sector. So how did I get involved in all of this? Well, this is me, all fresh-faced right at the beginning of this journey with lots of energy and what looks like quite a lot more teeth than your average person. <laughs> um, and, and, and I uh, found some real kindred spirits in this Data for Good community. I discovered that, like them, I loved solving problems and especially finding the best and most efficient ways of doing things. I'm also insatiably curious. I'm forever asking questions. Even as a toddler, my parents' nickname for me was Hannah Another Thing. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I'm not a data scientist. I don't even know how to code. But at my heart, I am a bit of a geek. I was that sort of slightly awkward teenager that had a colour-coded revision timetable. And I've always loved science. And in fact, that was the thing that brought me up here to the Northeast. I studied combined sciences here at Newcastle University. But it was the one non-science module I did that helped me discover my other passion, and that was young people. I found it so rewarding working with young people and helping them to build their skills and build their confidence and to see them unlocking their own potential. So my sort of after university, my career sort of ping-ponged between doing work that was to improve the lives of young people and doing work that was to improve the ways that businesses function and they operate. And then I hit the jackpot. Then I got the opportunity to lead an organization called The Key. The Key is a charity who has got a vision to inspire belief in young people and who back then, operationally, let's just say there was quite a lot of room for improvement. The Key um, is a small organization. Um, we turn over about half a million pounds a year. There's nine members of staff. And for 27 years, the key has done one thing, but we now do that one thing really, really well. Every year, about 2,000 young people come together to work in little teams, and they go through what we call the key framework. And this is where they dream up and they plan, they design, they deliver, and they review their very own youth-led projects. And if they can demonstrate to us how they've developed their skills and their confidence whilst planning their projects, we'll give them the money to turn their dreams and ideas into reality. So they don't do this on their own. Each team is supported by a trained facilitator. And that facilitator um, works for or volunteers for um, over 100 youth and community organizations across the Northeast. So I found when I first got into this job, I thought, right, I'm going to start putting all my business improvement stuff into place. Um, I was streamlining processes and modernizing systems. And in the first couple of years, we made loads of efficiency savings. And then I found that I got stuck, because unlike running a business, the key was there not to make a profit, but to make a difference. And although I didn't doubt that what the key did made a difference, in fact, instinctively, I knew that it did, what I realized is that I didn't really understand how it made a difference. And then it dawned on me, 
Unless you really have a deep understanding of how you make a difference in a charity, the pursuit of operational excellence is impossible. We could have been delivering whole chunks of things that weren't contributing at all to the end impact for young people. And there could have been essential elements or sort of core components of the key framework that if you remove them or compromise them in some way could have had a devastating effect on your impact. So then I realized for the first time these are the, uh, that there was completely different kinds of questions that I needed to ask and different data that I needed to collect in order to answer these questions. And this was the start of our data journey. And we created three principles to found this data journey on. The first and most important one being here, we wanted to ensure that every question that we asked and every piece of data that we collected was to in, un, first and foremost help us understand and to improve the impact that we had, not to prove that what we did worked. And that, that might sound nuanced, um, but I really believe that if you set out with an agenda to prove, you're gonna ask different questions and you're gonna collect different data and you're never actually gonna be able to celebrate the discovery of failure. So we'd started off on our data for good journey and it wasn't long before I realized the tremendous value and the generosity of volunteers in the data for good community. So when I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, these two chaps here, they helped me to uh, commission and to build a, a database and a CRM system from scratch. And when I started to get frustrated with just having data reports and I was craving analysis, I took part in an event called a Data Dive. And this is a bit like a weekend hackathon. And I had 40, over 40 data um, scientists and analysts and developers, and they were crunching away at my data and answering my questions and building tools that I could go away with and work with in the future. And I really felt like I was part of a community. And yes, that really is how much pizza we ate just in one sitting. It was incredible. <laughs> so I came away from that data really invigorated and inspired. But I was also armed with insights that I could use to shape the future of our organization. So for example, previously, one of the key core components that we discovered about the key framework was that we enabled young people to design any kind of project they wanted. And it was that autonomy and that ownership that was enabling us to have retention rates around 90%. So when funders came to me and they were saying, do you know what, Hannah, actually we would like our money just to go towards when there's enterprising projects or sports projects or arts projects because they're the ones that we believe is where young people will learn more. I was able to go straight back to them with the data and say, look, there's absolutely no relationship here between the project categories that young people are organizing and the overall impact on their personal development. So I was not only able to change the minds and in some cases the policies of funders, I was able to protect the fidelity of our framework. So, oh, I'll wait for that one. <laughs> um, so at this point, I was really raring to go and I was, uh, excited about our data journey moving forward as an organization. But I did not want to do this on my own. I wanted to involve everyone in my organization. And I wanted to build a curiosity culture. So I took the plunge and I decided to recruit a part-time data person. And of course, I had no idea how to recruit a data person or interview one. They could say anything and I would be impressed. So I once again drew on the experience of the uh, volunteers in the Data for Good community. And that's how we found the beloved Richard. Ah, oh, Richard. So he helped us to really bring this curiosity culture in our organization to life. He built an internal website that is still growing today, which was full of analytical tools, it was full of maps and data visualizations, and it was making data really relevant and accessible to every member in uh, our team in our organization. And Richard was also able to make the most of all these data volunteers that were offering us their time. He could package up data projects and he could support them to deliver them. Together we ran experiments, making small changes to our framework with, with small sample groups. And when we found that it made us a saving or it increased our impact, we rolled those changes out across the piece. For a long time, we've been trying to find a way to give data back to the organizations and the facilitators and the young people in a really meaningful way. But we haven't yet worked out how to do that. But what I do know is, is that if you send an unexpected email to a random group of facilitators, telling them things like, you are the fifth best facilitator in your area, 
then that does not make you very popular. <laughs> So there is still loads more that we can do at the quay. In fact, we've recently just started uh, a partnership with Newcastle College. And amongst other things, we're combining our data sets to see if the, using the quay framework is helping their students to improve their academic attainment. Um, and we've also, excitingly, just been given an immense opportunity to scale our work across the country. We're going to be finding ways to use technology to open up our framework and our processes and our systems to youth and community organisations across the country. And I'm really excited that that growth is going to be happening at the same time as the growth of the Data for Good movement. Now, one organisation that is at the forefront of offering this kind of support is DataKind UK. These are the guys who organised the Data Dive I mentioned earlier. Now, they have just three members of staff, and they've been able to mobilize over 1,000 data volunteers to work with over 80 charities, and they're doing some mind-blowing stuff. So when Centrepoint, a youth homelessness charity, came to them recently with a load of messy local authority data that they'd acquired through freedom of information requests, they were able to challenge national government statistics because they discovered that they'd underestimated the number of homeless young people in England by a factor of 10. So they not only were able to use that data to raise awareness of the true scale of that problem, but they were also created a data bank that they opened up for the entire sector to use. They've recently done some work with a food bank, and they've put artificial intelligence into their referral systems. This has meant that they've been able to identify high-risk individuals and clients, and they've been able to offer uh, additional support and services to them early on. And this is being shown to reduce the dependency that these families and these clients are having long-term on their services. Now, that's something that can not only be rolled out to other food banks across the country, but to any charity who has a similar kind of referral system. And they're doing more generic stuff as well. So they're working with an organization called Data Orchard to create a data uh, maturity framework. And this is helping charities or other social sector organizations who are interested in going on this data for good journey to plan out their continuous improvement activity. And only yesterday, an online tool was delivered. Uh, an online self-assessment tool uh, was launched um, for use for the whole sector. And it, universities are getting in on this too. So this summer saw uh, the Alan Turing Institute uh, partnership with Warwick University, and they delivered the first ever Data Science for Social Good Summer Fellowship in the UK. They've imported it over from Chicago. And the four projects that they have uh, delivered are incredible, one of which is claiming to be able to save the Paraguayan government almost $80 million by finding... Um, examples of fraud in their public procurement systems. So all of this stuff is pretty cool and pretty exciting. I hope you'll agree. The, one of the challenges, though, is that this is still typically quite London-centric. So there's still, there are some pockets of activity popping up in areas like Bristol and Birmingham and Edinburgh, but as far as the northeast goes, I'm still not aware of much stuff happening. But who knows, maybe after today, that might start to change. Thank you.